uh, Wednesday, August 28th, 2013, Committee of the Whole Meeting to order. Uh, before we take the roll, just a couple housekeeping things. Uh, I believe this is the first meeting other than a council meeting to be on board docs. So with us up here is our HR Director, uh, Dave Augustine. And as we go through the various documents, uh, Dave will be placing them on the screen uh, for those of you that don't have them with you here in the audience and also for the benefit of the people at home. Being that this is our first meeting under for, uh, this format, uh, if there's a uh, couple of glitches, please bear with us. Mary, would you please call the roll? Bellinger. Here. Boren. Here. Carlson. Here. Dassler. Here. Donahue. Here. Hammond. Here. Heidemann. Here. Herman. Here. Pizarre. Excused. Lewandowski. Here. Matichek. Here. Pentacle. Here. Thiel. Here. Van Akron. Not excused, Mr. President. You may want to take note of that. I think that's two in a row now. Unexcused absences. Yes. Vanderweel. Here. Versi. Here. 14 present. We have a quorum. Let's please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes from the last meeting. So move. I have a motion and a second to uh, approve the minutes from the last meeting. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Chair votes aye. Item 1.5, we have a public forum. Uh, each person who wants to speak will be allowed three minutes. Does anybody wish to be heard? Please step forward. Would you give us your name and address for the record, please? Dulce Johnson, 1306 North 3rd Street, Sheboygan. <clears throat> Thank you. You'll have three minutes. I hadn't planned to speak tonight, but then I read the story in the press about the ambulance billing, which is the focus of tonight's meeting. Per Mr. Amodio, the billing company collected 75.8% of its billings from January 2011 through December 2012. The citizens need to know that in arriving at that percentage, the city considers adjustments or amounts they could have collected in making that calculation, even though the city does not receive the adjustments. In an email to me last September, Mr. Amodio said that the most the city could collect is 58% of all claims billed, and that the city collected 77% of the 58% in 2011. Actual collections for 2011 were 41% of what was billed, and actual collections for 2012 were 42% of what was billed. What is actually collected is what matters, not what could have been collected. And if I remember correctly, EMS promised to collect 48% of what they billed. <clears throat> Again, I must ask you, do you think Orange Cross considers what they could have collected or adjustments that they had to write off as part of their total collections? I think not. What matters is what was actually collected and deposited in the bank. And in 2011, that was 41% of billings, and in 2012, actual collections were 42% of billings. The audit reported that in 2012, $650,000 was transferred to the general fund from the ambulance service, which is about half of what it cost to operate three ambulances 24-7. When total expenses were subtracted from actual collections, the ambulance service loss was over $300,000 in 2011 and over $150,000 in 2012. To say that the city collected 75.8% of its billings is, to quote Mr. Amodio's email to me last September, misleading. 
It is also disingenuous and gobbledygook. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to be heard? Does anybody else wish to be heard? Does anybody else wish to be heard? Okay, we'll move on. Chairman's comments, just have a couple brief ones. It's been, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the men and women of the uh, Sheboygan Fire Department, our, our paramedics, for, for, for providing an excellent ambulance service over the last five years. We're not here to discuss that tonight. We're here to discuss the financials of the ambulance service over the last five years. Uh, I just wanted you to remember a number tonight as we go through the numbers, and that is 48%. Back when we went into the ambulance service back in 2008, uh, the premise that was used, or the information that was used for the council back in 2008, and, and the projections that were made by the fire department back in 2008, that the collections were going to be eight, 48%. And unfortunately, up to this point, for five years, we have not reached the 48% mark yet. I'm not pointing fingers or blaming anybody. That's a reality. The purpose of this meeting tonight is to look at the history of the, uh, of the ambulance collections for the, for the first five years and hopefully make some improvements in the system to hopefully one day get up to the 48%. Uh, so that's... That's the purpose of the meeting tonight and also the fact that I believe Alderman Heidemann and I are the only aldermen remaining from back in 2008. So I thought this would be a good opportunity for the, for the new alder persons on the, on, the, uh, on the council to learn more about the ambulance service and how the financials of it work. So with that, we'll move on to item number 2.1, item uh, items for discussion only. A brief history on the Sheboygan Fire Department ambulance service and a five-year financial report on the Sheboygan Fire Department Ambulance Service for the years 2008 through 2012. Leading the discussion will be Mr. Eric Kiefer of e EMS Billing Associates, uh, Fire Chief Jeff Herman, and CA CAO, uh, Chief Administrative Officer Jim Amodio. So I'll turn it over to Chief Herman and Mr. Kiefer and Mr. Amodio. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman Bourne. <clears throat> uh, Chairman Bourne had asked me to give a brief history of how we got to this point. Um, coincidentally, this weekend I got a call from a press reporter uh, doing an article on the Sheboygan Falls uh, Fire Department and their 150th anniversary. And she asked when the fire, Sheboygan Fire Department began. Uh, so I looked back, um, and that date is 1888. Now I promise I'm not going back that far tonight, but just a bit of history. Uh, we realized it's our 125th anniversary this year. <clears throat> so just a little history for you. Um, the implementation of the ambulance service goes all the way back to about 1985. Um, back then we were taking a look at where's the fire service going, um, what's happening nationally. Um, we looked at, at the national averages and found that 80% of paid departments we're actually also running EMS. So we found that we weren't really in the norm in that area. So at that time, we began hiring firefighter EMTs also. So you had to be an EMT also to become a firefighter. Uh, moving on to about 1988, there was actually an advisory referendum in the city on a municipal ambulance service. And that passed by more than a two to one margin, uh, 9,265 votes to 4,436 in favor of a municipal ambulance service. So that kind of set us uh, in motion as to where we are going in the future. So I'll move ahead to about 2002, and by this time, we had seen the uh, table of organization in the fire department decrease from a number of 96 uh, in the 80s down to 77. Uh, ever tightening city budgets kind of made it clear that we needed to find a revenue source um, to offset our expenses and, and to um, continue to have the fire department that we had uh, and maintain our ISO rating that's very important for the insurance industry. Moving ahead then to 2007, which was when we put this business plan together, 
And there really were three main operational reasons um, in my mind that we looked at to begin the ambulance service. We already had been responding to every emergency medical call as first responders. So we weren't really adding any additional calls, we were just adding some additional revenue for already going to those calls. And one that was very important to me was the system control by the council. Prior to the fire department taking over the ambulance service, the citizens of Sheboygan had seen rate increases of 5%, 3.5, 3.9, and 10%. And the council had no jurisdiction over those increases. That all went before the county law committee. So I thought it was important to bring that control into the council. And then again, as I spoke, that we had to find a way to bring in some additional revenue to maintain our level of service to the community. I know in the past five years there have been numerous inaccurate and misleading statements made in committee meetings, at public forum, and on the council floor. <coughs> By the end of this meeting, my goal is to provide clarity on this issue and provide you with a clear understanding of what that 2007 business proposal was, what the expectations were of the fire department in that resolution, and what we've delivered to date in comparison to those expectations. So let me begin by explaining there really are three basic ways that ambulance revenues are tracked. All three of those are correct. All are done for different purposes. And I believe this is where a lot of the uh, confusion lies. I think this is where a lot of the misinformation is coming from. The three ways are by TRIP, also called data service. And this is really the only accurate means to account for ambulance collection percentages. We rely on our billing company to provide these numbers to us. They change daily because we're still making collections on 2009, 2010, 2011 runs. So those are constantly being updated. So that's one of the reasons you see collection percentages constantly changing. Second way is by calendar year, which is the way that I do it. Um, the city budget runs on a calendar year. My expenses run on a calendar year. And I offset those expenses by what we collect during that calendar year. <clears throat> and then the third way is by the, by the city auditors. And that's really a 14-month snapshot. The city auditors come in in the beginning of the year. Um, I think it's in February sometime. And they draw a line in the sand there and look back at what did we collect in the 12 months prior versus what were our expenses for the calendar year before that. So it's three different ways of accounting for ambulance collections. All of them have a, 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 a different outcome, but all of them are done for a different reason. So let me begin by taking you through the 2007 business plan. If you go down to um, about the fourth paragraph, there are revenue projections, and Chairman Bourne spoke of this. Um, there's been a lot of misinformation put out that there was a guarantee of 48% collection rate. Uh, former Chief Lestusky was just in town a week ago. I confirmed this with him. That was not a guarantee. Uh, that was where, and you'll see it as I go through the plan, that comes up numerous times. We based all of our revenue projections off of what the former uh, provider was collecting, which was 48% 48, 48 at the time. If you go down to the sixth bullet point there, and this was the one that I thought was really important as to why we got into this, service upgrade. As I said, we were going to every single call before. We were going to those calls as first responders. Even though we had paramedics and EMTs on our fire engines, by law, we could not act up to our level of training. All we could do was offer first responder services. By taking the service in-house, we now have been able to upgrade all our first responders to the EMT and the paramedic level. I think this is huge to, uh, advantage to the system. People don't realize that the first responders are a critical part of our response system. And then again on the bottom, the system control, as I explained before. Since we took over the service, our residents, because of your direction, have not seen a rate increase in six years. Uh, the next two pages are just a copy of that resolution that was passed in 2007 for your informational purposes. Next 
The next page is where we started basing some of our projections off of in 2007. And you'll notice in the top boxed part there, we were figuring a 15% no transport. In the five years that we've been running the service, we're actually at an 18% no transport. And you may say, well, that's bad. We're not transporting as many people. What I, I would tell you is that's good for the system. That means our paramedics out in the field are doing what they're trained to do. They're assessing people and they're not transferring people to the hospital that don't need to go. So that, I think that's a good thing that we, we can be proud of in our system. And then in the second box, you can see that all of our rate projections included a 3% increase every year as we went along. And as I said before, the council has not chosen to do that. So you can see our rates in 2013 are the same as they were in 2007. The next sheet that you have in front of you is, again, showing all of our projections but for the five-year business plan. And in that top upper uh, column, again, it shows transport revenues, assuming a 48% collection rate and the 3% rate increase per year. Again, it was not guaranteeing the 48% collection rate. That was just going off of numbers that were provided to us. And again, we did not increase those rates um, every year as it had been projected. So as you're moving down that first column in 2008, where you see total projected revenues, where we were projecting 675,000, we actually collected 737,000 that first year. And down at the bottom where we projected our expenses at 479,000, they actually were 421,000. So we had projected a net revenue of 195,000. We actually had 316,000 net revenue. Again, in 2009, projected revenues 714,000. They actually were 843,000. And projected expenses 479,000. Here we exceeded our expenses. They were 551. And that was uh, due to a, a large increase in overtime required that year. But again, the net re revenue on the bottom, we projected 234, but we still did exceed that with 291,000 brought in. Again, in 2010, projected revenue, 755,000. Actual revenue, 857,000. Projected expenses, 509,000. Actual expenses, 576,000. And again, we exceeded the net revenue we projected 246,000 and collect and had 280,000. 2011 projected revenues 799,000. We actually had revenues of 1 million. Projected expenses of 544,000, expenses 554,000. Again, we exceeded the net revenue where we projected 255 and collected 446,000. 2012, projected revenues of 846,000, actual revenues 1.155 million. And in this year, this is important to note that we began to bring our expenses under control. And a lot of this was due to negotiating a new contract with the union where we evened out some of our pay scales. So at the bottom, we had projected expenses of 582. We actually were underneath those expenses at 534. And then our net revenue, we projected 263. We actually had 620,000 extra net revenue. So for the five years, we had projected revenues of 3.7 million, and we actually had actual revenues of 4.6 million. And then the actual excess revenues that we put into the general fund, we had projected at 1.2 million, and we actually were at 1.9 million. And then if I can move ahead to 2013, um, right now we're on pace for about a 1.35 million in revenue, uh, which will put about 775,000 uh, as our net revenue for 2013. The next, one. the next page that you have in front of us is <coughs> some graphs that we put together. 
And one of the things that I wanted to, look, wanted to find out when I looked at our increased revenue was, I know that we've had increased number of transports, and I wanted to make sure that the increased revenue that we were seeing wasn't due solely to the extra number of calls that we were going on. <clears throat> so this first graph shows you that we've actually seen an increase of revenue per call in the five years that, we have, that we've been in operation. And then again, the bottom um, graph shows the percentage of the fire department budget that is funded now by revenue. You can see in 2008, the revenue we were bringing in only made up 1.8% of the fire department budget, where in 2012, it's making up almost 17% of the fire department budget. So again, we accomplished one of the goals I think that was set out way back in 2002. Then the next page, uh, we have a graph that shows uh, general fund contributions from the EMS revenues. And again, this is a graph that is trending in the right direction. We started out at 310 in 2008, and it shows the 620 in 2012. And then again, we're trending this year towards about a 775,000. So again, that graph is going in the right dire direction. And then again, when I saw that our revenues were going up, I wanted to make sure that our expenses were not outpacing the revenues that we were bringing in. And that bottom graph shows that actually the percent of our revenues versus our expense is actually getting better. So if you move on to the next page, what does this all mean for how, is, how much is the fire department costing the city taxpayers? As you see in 2007, it was roughly $7.4 million when you took the expense of the fire department, offset it with revenues. Moving on to 2012, when you took the expense and offset that with the EMS revenues, that dropped down to $6.4 million. And then what does that do to our cost per capita? Again, that drops uh, significantly, as does the cost of the fire department from $148 per capita down to $129 per capita. Then the next um, sheet that you have in front of you is just those numbers that I, I gave you put into a graph form. So it's showing that um, the revenues that we projected have always been outpaced by the net revenue that we've collected. And then again, the gross revenues that we projected is, uh, is being outpaced by our actual gross revenues that we are collecting. And then the bottom graph is showing what I had explained before, that um, our expenses have been up in a number of years, but we brought them down under control in 2011 and 2012. One of the other things that I had asked our billing company to do for us earlier this year was to do a rate survey amongst um, comparable cities. I wanted to make sure that the rates that we were charging were in the ballpark of where we needed to be. So that this page shows you of comparable rates. Um, the ones that I would compare would say are in our, our service area close to us um, would be Orange Cross and Plymouth Ambulance. Um, as you can see, we, we um, compare favorably to those, and our rates compared to the average are, I, it looks to me like we're right where we need to be. Um, I don't believe that the council needs to take any action at this point. I think we're being fair to our citizens. Any questions so far? I just had one, Chief, on one of the graphs here. Just a little extra explanation. It was the one where was the graph where you were talking about, uh, was it negotiating a new contract or something like that? Was, that? was that partially due to Act 10 that the employees were paying more for their health insurance and into the Wisconsin Retirement Fund? Did that help any? Um, Did actually, that factor that, into that or not? Yeah, that is not figured into this. This was the contract negotiations where we created a two-tiered wage schedule, which uh, lowered the wages of our, our new employees. That's what that's reflecting. So I'd, the Act 10 has not been factored into that. That also would have an effect on it. Alderman Versi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Also, with some of these prices that oh, it's really loud. <laughs> um, the, um, that you have here for different municipalities. Um, some of these municipalities that you have listed on here don't itemize like we currently do. Um, some do, some don't. So, I mean, the, the ballpark rate, the going rate, has to be explained more in depth on which, which companies itemize their runs, which don't, such as Orange Cross does, does not itemize like we do. Gold Cross does also not itemize like we do. Um, and also um, a Schwabanon and also uh, County Rescue up in Green Bay do not itemize. And um, so, I mean, that's where the price difference, you have to make sure the full picture is being and seen. And I do have those, and those are two pages long, and we go drug by drug, and we make sure that we're in line with them. To say they don't itemize is correct and uncorrect. A lot of them bundle their charges into mm -hmm. one charge. A lot of them will take that bundle, and there may be 12 items in there being oxygen, saline, needles, whatever, and charge individually. So, yeah, you are correct. It, it, we'd be here all night if I brought that out. Okay. Any other questions before we move on? Go ahead, Chief. I got one question. What do you actually classify as an ambulance call? Because if you get a call for a house that's on fire and you're told that nobody's hurt, but once you get there, you find out that somebody has inhaled a lot of smoke, would that still be considered an ambulance call? Um, there's two answers to that question. If we transport them to the hospital, that would be considered an ambulance, a billable ambulance call. If we would treat them on the scene, it all would depend on the level of treatment that we give them, whether or not we would charge them. But if they're, if they're treated on scene and not transported, that's a much lower charge. Anybody else? Proceed. Next, we're going to hear from uh, Mr. Eric Kiefer, who is with EMS Billing. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for having us. And if I may, I'd, I'd like to just briefly state, first of all, thank you for allowing us to uh, present here this evening. Uh, we are very honored to serve the city of Sheboygan and hope we're allowed the opportunity to continue. And also, I, I appreciate the uh, committee's indulgence in postponing uh, tonight's meeting until August here. I know you want to do this last month, uh, but I uh, was assisting my daughter through a kidney transplant last month, so I was in the hospital, died, so I do appreciate uh, your indulgence in moving it to August. So, um, My job here tonight is to explain uh, the revenue from 2008 uh, till 2012. So first of all, uh, we have to realize that EMS Medical Billing was not the billing service for the city of Sheboygan for 2008, 2009, and 2010. So in order to represent those dollars, we simply used uh, city uh, data for those three years, which is labeled as page number two uh, on our handout, which should be the next page on the presentation here. And so Obviously, as, as not the billing service for the city of Sheboygan during that time, I don't necessarily feel comfortable commenting on net revenue one way or the, not, or the other. I think uh, my job here tonight is to present uh, the data as we began billing in 2011 and cover that year in 2012, which would be the next page. So the data that we present, and it, we, we covered it here tonight, the chief touched on it, there's different ways that data can be reported financially, obviously. Each individual uh, person that is running those for finance or for fire or for billing will run it in a different way for a different purpose. And as the chief stated, uh, the, the revenue, how we report revenue, and the way that it is reported on this report is by date of service. So when I say that something for 2011 is for any date of service or any EMS run that occurred during the calendar year of 2011. So what I plan to do is to walk you through some of these numbers as well as these categories of numbers is to uh, kind of simplify the procedure so we all understand the terminology and then allow you to ask any pertinent questions you might have. So for 2011, uh, the revenue generated for 2011 dates of service was 1.034 million, uh, 1034.278 to be precise. The average collected per call was $398.06. That was taking the run volume and dividing it by the net receivables for the year. The gross collection rate 
uh, was 47.14%. So of all the charges that were produced during that year for those dates of service, 47.1% of revenue were returned. But there's another form of a collection rate, which is called the net collection rate, which is more accurate when you're taking a look at how a billing service is performing. And that net collection rate, the net collection rate, takes those adjustments that are mandated by Medicare and Medicaid and it takes them out of the equation because you couldn't have collected those by law anyway. And you take only those revenues that you could collect. For instance, if commercial insurance did not pay for some reason that you can collect that, that would count against you. Or if you sent a statement to a patient that didn't have insurance and they didn't pay for one reason or another, that would count against your net collection rate. But only those adjustments or only those dollars you didn't collect that you couldn't collect or that you could collect legally are counted against you in the net collection rate. I hope that makes sense. Because that's how we, we report our current net collection rate for 2011 days of service as 79.47%. Now, when we reported in February, that net collection rate was 77.65. What made the difference? Well, a number of your accounts that were referred to external collections and to the Wisconsin Tax Refund Intercept Program came through and got paid that increased those dollars for that year, uh, even just in the last few months. So as the chief pointed out, these numbers are very fluid. They do change often. They change every day. As a matter of fact, there is one typo that I will correct later uh, that uh, is because I received data today just in a phone call that I needed to include in the presentation. So uh, we'll touch upon that as well. So the graph that you see before you, for, where it's labeled Sheboygan 2011, I think we're all familiar with the payer categories. In other words, how an ambulance service gets paid for their calls. But I'll just briefly walk through it with your indulgence. Medicare, which is the, the uh, uh, insurance program for the elderly, uh, it's through Social Security. Um, people have to pay for a Part B insurance. They get Part A through Social Security and so forth. That uh, Medicare is your largest payer population. Then through the Medicaid program, which is for the poor or underinsured. Commercial insurance, which is typically tied to employment. So if I'm employed through EMS Medical Billing, if I get my insurance through my employer, that's typically where this uh, payer category uh, explains itself. And private would be uh, self-pay. If you don't have insurance, you're a private pay patient. Other would be considered perhaps a uh, contractual relationship we might have with a nursing home or another establishment, or you said a contracted price for transports. Uh, as you can see, that's extremely neg negligible in your numbers, but we do account for it with its own uh, category. So briefly working right to left, <coughs> Uh, and again, remember, this is, uh, for those of you who saw our presentation in February, we were really asked to keep things in the exact same format as the previous presentation, just so we can compare numbers. So um, moving right to left um, is gross charges. That's exactly what was billed out to the insurance company. No write-offs, the dollar value that was billed out. Contractual allowances are those adjustments that you have to take off by law with Medicare and Medicaid. Those are what's called contractual adjustments. Or if you have a contractual relationship with an insurance company or a commercial insurance company, you would take those adjustments at the time that you bill it. And that's where you would report those. Revenue adjustments are, well, sometimes we don't bill out the correct insurance the first time. So when we get the actual insurance the second time, we might have to make an adjustment on that that we build. So that's called a revenue adjustment. Net charges, that's what brings you down to exactly then what the insurance company is being asked to pay. Payments, obviously self-explanatory. These are dollars in the bank. Refunds, refunds are part of EMS billing. You bill the wrong uh, insurance company or the coordination of benefits gets uh, tied up where somebody's coverage might have terminated a day or two earlier. It happens all the time. So we have to issue refund checks back to patients, back to insurance companies uh, quite frequently. So you certainly have to keep track of those and apply those towards the net revenue. Write-offs. Now, these are different from contractual allowances. Write-offs are write-offs that you take voluntarily because a patient could not pay a bill or they asked for a hardship, so they have their own category. So these are con not contractual allowances. These are ones that were taken voluntarily. The number of trips, well, terminology, trips and incidents are synonymous. So the number of ambulance runs is a, is a trip. So we've broken out the number of trips during that year by what payer group they belong to. The payer mix. The payer mix, this tells us where your money is coming in from. In this case, 49% of your, uh, your charges are going out as Medicare patients. 20% or almost 21 Medicaid and so forth. 
and then the net collection percentage. After you take all the mandatory adjustments and you apply the, all these categories across, refunds and so forth, what is your net collection rate on those payers? Because now you can really identify where your money is. And if you're leaving any money on the table, where is it? So if you, if you would like to take a look at that column, the far right column on 2011, uh, you can see 98% uh, for Medicare collection rate. You might ask, why not 100%? Because there's five, six, seven claims in any given year that might be still under uh, review. People are still applying for Medicare. Coordination of benefits are not yet complete. So you'll never truly reach 100%. You hope to get 98, 99% with those. And we, we're achieving those on a regular basis with Medicare and Medicaid. Medicaid, 98.55. Commercial insurance, 87.91. Uh, why 87.91? Because there are still, with commercial insurance companies, something called coordination of benefits. If you're not able to establish when coverage was, anybody involved in my industry will know that commercial insurance is not exactly the most prompt in responding to requests and so forth. So you can have issues drag out over years, including litigation. If you are in a car accident and it's going to be in litigation, but the primary payer was a commercial insurance company and that's how it's still categorized, it might still be hanging out there in the accounts receivable, which uh, that's where these are hanging out. And then private, uh, of course, the lowest. Anybody without insurance, why don't they have insurance? They're probably unemployed. They don't have the means uh, to pay those bills, so your collection rate on those claims are going to be the lowest of any of your collection group. So in 2011, there was a 26.39% collection rate, so basically 26 cents on the dollar for everything that you build out to a patient without insurance was paid back. So we are looking, again, at a net collection rate for 2011 of 7947 Again, this is on dates of service for that year only. Uh, and then there's other various uh, data elements that are below. For instance, we like to keep track of the billable and non-billable calls. So you can determine how many claims got billed and how many didn't get billed because they weren't billable. So what is a non-billable call? Well, if an ambulance responds to an incident at a basic life support level, which is a lower level than a paramedic level, and they don't provide any services to the patient, currently the city does not bill for that service. So that becomes a non-billable call. Now, an incident where if they were called to a diabetic or an asthmatic and an advanced life support person arrives or a paramedic, they provide an IV of dextrose to wake the patient up or uh, albuterol to help the patient breathe. That is an invasive procedure. Even though you're not transporting, that patient would get a bill. So there's difference in transport versus non-transport and even whether that patient gets a bill or not, depending on the level of service provided. And then the gross collection rate, 47.1%, 1.4%. Billable uh, revenue per billable call. This is how we like to do business, and this is when we're competing for business, we don't like to say this is our collection rate or that's their collection rate or that's their collection rate because you can calculate collection rate any way you want to to make it look good for you. How much are you making every time you turn a wheel on a billable call? That's how we like to do to compare how we're doing business. So right now we're looking at $398.06 every time the fire department turns a wheel on a billable call. And then the, the amount for all calls, which include non-billable $334 and so forth. So that kind of encapsulates 2011. Was there uh, any, I know because this is very industry specific language, it, it takes uh, some getting used to with the terminology and so forth. Is there any clarification that I can provide or anything that wasn't clear? I have just a couple. Uh, <clears throat> the. Uh, I know on Medicaid, because I used to be a Medicaid provider, uh, but with, Medi with, with Medicaid, we definitely have to accept what they pay us. On Medicare, do we accept what they pay, or is there an opportunity to bill for the difference with, with, with Medicare? Medicare right now requires all ambulance service providers to what they call accept assignment. In other words, you have to accept what Medicare pays, uh, but not payment in full. As you know from billing Medicaid, you can't balance bill the patient. You just take what Medicaid pays, and right. you're done. Medicare works a little bit differently they will allow a certain amount on your charges and pay 80% of that. Then the 20% copay always gets passed on to the patient or their co-insurance. So there is an opportunity to collect additional revenue after Medicare, but what you hope to collect is what Medicare originally says this is our allowable amount. That would be what we would consider a 100% collection rate on a Medicare call. So we're not going after the 20%? We are, oh absolutely, right. Okay, yes. good. Absolutely. Good. Again, it's very important uh, for everyone to realize that our fee is we are paid on a percentage of what we collect. It would be very foolish for us to leave money on the table, especially money that was legally able to be collected. 
Then my other observation is under commercial, the only, the only peer group that we would actually have an opportunity, let's say for example the bill was $1,000, the only one out of those, those categories where we can get money from, uh, the only one where we could potentially collect $1,000 on a $1,000 bill would be under the commercial and that's only 17.10 of our total business. Yes, sir. That's correct on both accounts. Okay, it's just, uh, it's a little shocking, uh, you know, when, when we would be in a business where we only have it, uh, an opportunity to collect 17% of, of, of our total bills. It's, it's a little surprising to me, but that's, that's the payer mix. Alderperson Donahue? Um, thank you. Um, it's my understanding that, that of the calls that we make, 17% of the payment comes from commercial insurance. Correct? In other words, in the, in the pie of 100%, 17% of that are people who have commercial insurance. Yes. We don't get to choose that. That's correct. So in some ways, we're lucky. Of course, we're never lucky to have you know, people who are in an ambulance, but we're lucky that 49% of our payor mix is Medicare. That's right. All right. So I think uh, we just need to get in mind is, is that it's not that we're collecting just 17% of commercial insurance. That is. That's the slice of the pie from which our revenues come. That's right. So the devil is in the details here. Is that we always need to keep in mind what the pies are that we're talking about and not look at percents and say, oh my goodness, we're only collecting 17% of commercial or 12% of private. That is the payor mix. And I just wanted to clarify that just to make sure that I understood it. Yes, ma'am, you did. Thank you. Yes. Well, I, I understand that also, but that, that also points out that out of that entire payor mix, there's only 17. There's only 17 percent of the patients apparently that we have a chance to call, get 100 percent reimbursement on. Well, and and that just happens to be because we can't control who gets sick and who calls for an ambulance. For better or for worse, nearly 50 percent of the people who call in the city of Sheboygan for an ambulance apparently are older or disabled people. We can't control that. That's not a business factor that we can control. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and I will tell you that commercial insurance rarely pays at the charged rate, rarely, rarely pays. So if the, if the charge is $683, the commercial insurance is unlikely to pay $683. Again, we need to be clear about what, what we're talking about in the, in the realm of collection, the, 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 the gross the gross charges here, those are gross charges. You can't, you, you're never gonna get those gross charges. It's unhappy, but it's true. And, and no matter how we fuss and fight and fume about it, the only people that we can really get 100% from are the poor schleps who don't have insurance. Those are the people who are paying the full freight. Those are the people who are paying $683 or whatever the, the ambulance charge might happen. I just picked that figure. Whatever the ambulance charge might be. The people who are the least able to pay are the only ones that we can get 100% from. That's life. But typically those folks are judgment proof unless we are getting tax intercepts. And we could do that for one year because if you have your tax refund intercepted one year, you're gonna make sure in the next year you don't have a tax refund. So, I mean, that's just, that's life. So, folks, the people who we can bill for 100% are the people who are the least able to pay. It's just life. That's the way our rather screwy health insurance industry works. Just to follow up on that, Alderperson Donahue, I had a neighbor who had to use the ambulance service, our city ambulance service, and they were billed one, approximately $1,000. Their, her employer's insurance paid $500. She paid the other $500. So the point I'm making in commercial insurance is out of the 683, if that's what the total bill is, their insurance may pay 400. We collect the rest from the person. So that, that is an that's the opportunity under commercial that we do have an opportunity to collect 100%. And I'm glad that, that you have that one example but from the commercial insurance bills that I have reviewed in the course of my work over the years, it's rare that typically 
you're going to have your deductible and your copay, and then the, the, the insurance company is going to pay its negotiated rate, and you, as, a, as an employee under the plan, you don't have to pay the balance, typically. Unfortunately, your neighbor was not a, a lucky person to have a decent insurance policy, but mm. that's one example, and we can't really make our decisions based on one example. But we do, Mr. Kiefer, though, if the insurance company pays $500 <coughs> commercial insurance, the person, is res in, the person in all likelihood is going to be responsible for the balance, and you're going to try to collect it. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. That's, that was my point. Thank you. If there are any further questions on 2011, 2012, just a mirror image of the data ahead of it in 2011. However, important to realize that 2012 is a lot more fluid than 2000, 2012 is a lot more fluid than 2011 is. It's, we are still collecting revenue for, for 2012 dates of service, especially through collections and trips. So the, the, the revenue generated for 2012 dates of service right now at 1.167 million is still increasing as is the average collected per call of 386.34, as is the estimated gross collection rate of 42.76% and the current net collection rate of 74%. So there's still additional revenue for 2012, obviously that's being worked both in our office actively through coordination of benefits, as well as through collections, uh, through our external collection agency and through the tax refund intercept program uh, through the other uh, collection agency that handles that. Uh, that work. Excuse me, Mr. Kiefer. I believe uh, Alderman Carlson. Did you have a question? Good for now. Thank you. Proceed. Sorry. It's quite all right. Um, you will obviously take a look. The numbers for collection rates are lower. Again, this is proceeding back to my previous statement. It is still fluid. We are still collecting money on a relatively aggressive level on 2012 dates of service. So you will see collection rates for Medicare at 97.9 increase. The same for Medicaid, commercial insurance. I when I before I came here tonight, I looked at 83 percent collection rate for commercial insurance, and I wanted to know why. So I went claim by claim to figure out where those commercial claims were being held up, and I got the answers, and most of them are coordination of benefits issues. There's some bankruptcies that are, are still being reported in that, that bucket. So there's nothing, uh, I answered my questions. There's no serious concerns on that. I just expect that, uh, that collection rate to increase as the others do as well. So the self-pay uh, collection rate, substantially less than 2011. However, we are still billing those patients. And when you're talking about collections and tax refund intercept program, that's when some of these revenues can substantially jump your self-pay population because that's where the money is. So if you have patients that are on, uh, they can't afford to pay the bill and they're on a time pay and they're on a $20 a month, you're not going to see these collection rates jump relatively quickly. You will see them jump quickly when tax refund intercept program kicks in or when uh, a collection agency gets those accounts and begins to actively work them. That's when you'll see those accounts start to go up. But many trips in 2012, the latter half of 2012, aren't old enough yet uh, to be considered uh, a collections account. So we still are working this 2012 relatively aggressively. Any questions? If you turn to page uh, four, I, want, I included this uh, payer mix and net collection rate comparison, one, because it was in our February presentation and I wanted to be consistent, but also because uh, in the Sheboygan Press story there was a, a statement that if our demographics, Sheboygan's demographics were different, that might somehow affect your net collection rate. And I wanted to demonstrate how that is a relatively accurate statement using your payer mix from 2011 and 2012 and comparing them to the two payers that we presented back in February, which were the city of Franklin and the city of Fond du Lac. As you can see, uh, their Medicare population is greater, um, their Medicaid population is smaller, their commercial population is larger, and their self-pay population is smaller. So with those all combined, your net collection rate is going to be relatively higher. So I just wanted to include that that uh, comparison for your review. Alderman Versi. Hey, Mr. Chairman. So, Mr. Kiefer, so that actually the, the optimal demographics we'd really be looking at is higher commercial and higher Medicare. That, so higher correct. commercial would be, would be premium for us, and then also the Medicare keeps keeping the same level, but lowering our Medicaid and self-pay. It's that would accurate. be the optimal. Yeah, it's accurate to say that commercial insurance and Medicare are the two payest hires of, of the major groups that we bill for. That's correct. 
Anybody else? Thank you, Alderman Versi. Continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a different uh, item point on the agenda, the reimbursement concerns under the Affordable Care Act. So I just wanted to, before I moved on to that point, ask, was there any other clarifying questions on the previous point, which were the revenues? Very good. Well, I wish I had a litany of information that I could provide on the Affordable Care Act, but um, you'll, is from a reimbursement standpoint, and this is, I really want to emphasize this, from a reimbursement standpoint, information that providers are getting on how much is going to be paid to providers, there is almost no information that is available to providers, especially ambulance service right now. There is nothing concrete or specific that's come down from the federal government of what they're going to pay on an ambulance claim uh, once the Affordable Care Act goes into place. So we're not in the speculation business. Uh, we're not going to... Uh, take a look at what might be without pertinent information to pass along to the city so they can make an informed decision. But uh, there was a story uh, in the Sheboygan Press that did touch on this, so I did want to reference this, where they said that collections could improve under the Affordable Care Act if more uninsured patients become insured. And, and that, I would say, is probably an accurate statement. If you're uninsured and you now come into a, an exchange and you are able to get some of that treatment uh, paid for, it stands to reason that uh, you could potentially make more revenue from that payer mix. Um, there's also the contrary point of view that you need to consider that if that person had commercial insurance prior and was their employer dumped their commercial insurance coverage to go into an exchange, that claim that would have been paid at potentially $700 now might be paid at a much lower rate. So again, competing theories, we don't want to get into speculation, but we just want to, I wanted to respond to this, uh, the statement that was in the story and then uh, be able to provide a different opinion on that. Uh, we are investigating other opportunities, though, through uh, the Affordable Care Act uh, that the fire department can't participate in, except, but many of those programs are in their infancy stage. They, I'm not ready to speak on those. I have no uh, specific details to share, but we are staying on top of the Affordable Care Act. That is our job as a billing service to make sure that you are fully compliant with Medicare and Medicaid and with the Affordable Care Act when it rolls out in 2013, which the next uh, paragraph does point out just some basic facts uh, regarding the Affordable Care Act that the marketplace for the Affordable Care Act does open October 1st. Uh, that's where you will be able to enter into or buy an insurance uh, policy through an exchange if it's available here in Wisconsin. Uh, the individual mandate is still scheduled to start 2014, so if you're an individual without insurance, uh, you will be required uh, to, to enter into that agreement. Uh, but the employer mandate, uh, where the employer provides that care for their uh, employees has been delayed till 2015. So that is all we feel comfortable sharing at this point as far as uh, anything strategic to look at. And the last item on our agenda this evening was to discuss the Wisconsin tax excuse refund me, intercept. Excuse me, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Alderman, Alderman Bellinger. Thank you, Chairman. Um, sir, it didn't the, the uh, individual mandate get rolled back a year because Obama didn't want to have it during an election year? So it's not 2014. Just the employer, Just the employer okay. mandate is what I'm, I'm familiar with. Okay. The individual so mandate, from my understanding, still goes into effect at the beginning of the year. Okay. <coughs> Thank you, Alderman Bellinger. Uh, the last item on our agenda was to talk about the Wisconsin Tax Refund Intercept Program. And for the benefit of those who in the audience who may not know what that is, I just want to put down a brief definition of what that might be and if I may read it. It's Wisconsin statutes authorize the Department of Revenue to intercept taxpayer refunds, other refundable credits, lottery credits, to be applied against the amount the taxpayers owe to certain state agencies and local governments. Agencies and local governments must enter into a written agreement with the Department of Revenue to participate in this program. So the city of Sheboygan does have a written agreement and they do participate in this program. Uh, the current environment uh, in which tax refund intercept program lives in Sheboygan begins with the collections phase. So the city of Sheboygan currently sends delinquent EMS claims uh, to be processed through an ex external collection agency that we work with. They're called AmeriCollect. They're out of uh, Manitowoc. And the fee for this service is 33% of the net revenue collected. Now, if AmeriCollect is unable or unsuccessful in collecting on a claim after nine months under their roof, the account is turned over to another collection agency that we work with that specializes in the TRIP program. They're called CMC, or Credit Management Control, out of Green Bay. And the fee for this service is 17% of net revenue collected. 
Now, the details accounts listed with TRIP so far is the city began listing accounts with TRIP in August of 2012. And from August 2012 through January 2013, $358,000 in change was listed with the tax refund intercept program. So far to date, $32,775 has been collected, which is a 9% collection rate on that $358,000 submitted. The fee the city paid for this service was $5,571. For dates of service of February 2013 through August 2013, an additional $168,000 in change was submitted to TRIP. However, none of that revenue has yet been paid through TRIP. Now, what's the significance of that? Indicating the tax season is pretty much over. So you're not going to get any payments on those accounts until the next go around in 2014. Which leads me to my last statement, and this is where my typo was. The unpaid amount of, and allow me to correct myself, $493,034, because we received a payment today, will roll over to the 2014 tax season and have another attempt at collections, along with the new delinquent accounts that we're building up through 2013. So there is going to be a substantial opportunity for additional revenue next year with TRIP, almost to the, certainly over a half a million dollars. So no telling what that collection percentage is going to be. The next page, page six of six in the handout, and on the, uh, I simply wanted to provide you with a uh, listing of trip payments from CMC uh, by week, so you can see how that money comes in and how it's accounted for. It's just there for informational purposes only. Nothing significant about the spreadsheet, just this is where the money's coming and when it came in. Alderman Hammond. Mr. Kiefer, just a quick question. Um, under refundable, other credits um, that are subject to this TRIP program, are the, is the earned income credit one of them, or is that exempted from that um, for the TRIP program? I'm sorry, I do not know that. Okay. I can certainly find out and get back to you. Thanks, Alderman Hammond. Okay. If there's any questions on the spreadsheet, it's pretty straightforward. As you can see, in February 6th, February two, uh, 13th, there's your big deposits coming through in the tax season. They were intercepted in January and posted in February. Then it dwindles as the months go on. Now it's our understanding that the uh, city is considering bringing this, this practice back into house. So all I uh, simply wanted to do was put forth considerations that the city would be considering if they were going to do that. One is that each account uh, must be certified with the Department of Revenue before it's placed. Uh, with the proper name, address, phone number, employment of the, of the patient, social security and, and driver's license number. Those information pieces are required. Our collection agency uses a program called LexisNexis to provide that information. It's a relatively expensive product to get that correct information if it's incorrect the first time. Uh, rejected accounts must be reworked and according to the DOR's reject code. So it's, it, it takes a relatively, uh, it takes some knowledge of the tax refund intercept program and the codes that are provided by the state to do that properly. Uh, letters must be sent to each account prior to the placement in TRIP. Uh, you must complete the TRIP paperwork on each account uh, with supporting documentation and submit that to the state. Of course, postage and all associated supplies are included in that. And uh, the filling of all calls uh, would not then come to our office. That's a very important feature that I wanted to share. That goes to the entity that is submitting that account to trip, so somebody would have to field those calls. And then, of course, you must have a way of tracking those accounts, tracking the payments, the refunds, and tracking the resubmissions. As these are official documents with the Department of Revenue, they will be audited. So you have to have something relatively stable as a product that you can produce those reports for the state. Alderman Hammond. Um, thank you. Um, Mr. Kiefer, how many of these accounts have we submitted to the TRIP program ballpark? I don't need an exact number. But About 700. So 700. So roughly our cost, and this is about four bucks a, uh, an account. I didn't do them. I assume you did the math. I will trust you all. So about four dollars. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Kiefer, can these submissions on the TRIP program, can that be done online, or is that, is that a hard copy that has to be sent in? I do not know that. That's a good question. My initial guess would be that it has to be on paper, that it's not an online process, um, but I will get that information and get back to you, sir. I think our uh, municipal court is involved in the TRIP program, and I think they are doing it in-house, but I'm not familiar with how they do it, but we could find out also. Any other questions? 
Thank you, Mr. Kiefer, for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having us. We appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Do you have anything else under that item, Chief Herman? We're all set? Okay. Next, we'll move down to item number three, items for discussion and possible recommendation of the Common Council. Council uh, agenda item 3.1, Council document. Alderman Hammond, did you have something? Go ahead. Uh, Council document 3.1, Council document number 5.4 from July 1, 2013, and 3.17 from July 15, 2013. A resolution by Alderman Hammond authorizing extending the contract with EMS Medical Billing Associates, LLC of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, for providing emergency medical services billing and collection service for an additional two-year period by letter or agreement to that effect. Uh, please see a copy of the contract attached. Uh, we have that coming up. A discussion with Fire Chief uh, Jeff Herman and Chief Administrative Officer Jim Amodio. Alderman Hammond. Um, thank you. For discussion purposes, I move to uh, recommend to the council we approve the contract with EMS Billing Services. Second. We have a motion and a second to, uh, to approve the renewal of the contract with EMS Billing under discussion. Uh, if we could, we have the contract up there. Uh, anybody who's reviewed the contract, are there any questions? I think I had a couple marked off here. Uh, could you just go over the uh, how uh, how we arrived at the uh, the uh, the trip trip system? Uh, uh, how we arrived at that seventeen percent commission? I didn't see that, I don't believe I saw that written anywhere in the contract. Was that an update that we did? Mr. Chairman, I think that was an amendment to the contract, an amendment I did not bring with me this evening. Okay. Uh, did that amendment go through the Finance Committee? I don't remember seeing anything like that on the agendas. Do you remember, do you remember that, Alderman Hammond? That was, that was you know, July of 2012, so no, I wouldn't remember something on the agenda from 2012. Uh, Mr. Amodio, do you, remember if there were, do you remember if that went through Council, that TRIPS thing for the uh, Commission of 17%, or was that just done in-house? It, and then on, on page 10 of the, uh, of the contract, just a bullet point there, the City of Sheboygan Finance Director and the service provider will mutually agree on a plan for pre-authorization of any debt write-off or write-down activity prior to the elimination of any debt. I would presume that's on a case-by-case -case basis? Correct. The only other question I had, if I can find it here, and that was with the uh, with the payer group that's uh, that has no insurance, no Medicare, no Medicaid, no insurance, uh, is there any way, anything that we could do further, Mr. Kiefer, to enhance that that portion of the collections? I know that's a difficult one because those people don't have insurance or anything else, and may, many times are are indigent. But is there anything that any of your other clients do, or is there anything you could suggest to maybe pump that area up a little bit? Well. 
the question you have, you have to yourself, what is being done to maximize collections from the self-pay population? And the best that you can do is contact the patient as often as you possibly can to arrange a payment, set up a payment plan if they can't afford it. And there is simply just a, a there's also a, a level of our population that doesn't make a payment until they get a collection letter. Uh, so you have to account for that as well. But the best way to determine is, is from our perspective, from our company's perspective, we are doing everything that we can to maximize those payments before they ever leave our office. Because remember again, we're paid on a percentage basis. It is not in our best interest to leave that revenue to somebody else to collect. So we would rather collect that in-house and make our profit on that revenue. So another question to ask then is, if we're not collecting it, is somebody else? Are we leaving money on the table that somebody else is collecting? Well, the answer to that, is you have to take a look at the collection agency that follows you. How are they doing? What is their track record? Well, right now, uh, AmeriCollect is collecting 5.5% on what we're submitting to them, which is lower than an industry standard. So we are doing a very good job in maximizing the receivables because a collection agency that has more resources at their disposal than we do as far as collecting revenue from people in various different forms is not collecting that money either on any great scale. So we consider the fact that the collection rate of 26%, I, I sympathize. I would like to be able to collect more revenue for you to make our company more profitable, to make you more profitable, but there are simply just a, a, some patients that can't afford it, won't pay it, and you do your best to maximize that while you've got it in-house, while that debt is current, instead of trying to collect that debt when it's not current, which is very difficult. So the short answer, to my very long answer, is uh, we are trying everything we can to maximize it. Uh, from our standpoint, uh, our processes are working, and I, I don't see necessarily anything we can do in-house to, to maximize that any further. I, uh, I can't find the process in here in the contract. I apologize. But the other question I would have, and maybe it answered in here, is uh, how soon is a phone call made to that population? I understand they get a bill, and then after 30 days, they're billed for, for three straight months, 90 days, am I correct? Is my memory correct? And then and somewhere in the process, you make, make, may make a phone call to that person to try to get payment. Uh, when do we make the first phone call generally? That phone call generally comes when that account is 60 days without any contact with our company. Okay. So uh, you can talk about number of days old. We would consider an account 60 days aged when there's been 60 days of no contact with our company. So no attempt on their part to set up a payment plan, no attempt to send in a payment and so forth. Two statements without any contact with us generally will initiate a phone call from our collections division, and we'll take a look at those accounts that we consider to be the most collectible amongst the group and focus in on those with our resources and try to collect that way. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? The, uh, I think before, uh, Alderman Hammond, uh, we were, we were going to consider under 3.2 uh, a possibility of bringing the TRIP program in-house, and I'm wondering if it would be appropriate, or it's a question for maybe Attorney McLean too, being that we might want to make an amendment to the contract where we have a motion and a second to approve it, would it be, I, I think it might be appropriate to, to discuss 3.2 to see if it's going to fly bringing it in-house, and if it doesn't, we can renew the contract as is, but if we decide we may want to bring that in-house, we'd have to amend the contract. Alderman Donahue. Um, I would strongly suggest that the, um, the bringing the TRIP uh, uh, process in-house, first of all, we need a whole lot more information before we can make an intelligent decision, and that clearly should be done at the committee level. Mm -hmm. uh, for all of us to sit here and try and figure out whether or not we should be involved in this is is spinning our wheels. So I will say in support of the motion as it stands, um, this is the second time that I've heard the presentation from the gentleman and um, for the second time I've been pretty impressed. Um, I think the numbers speak for themselves in terms of the fact that we um, have an agency that is one pretty skilled. I mean I, they seem to have, uh, the agency seems to have its arms around the process. Number two, they seem to be doing a very nice job for us. One of the hard things for all of us lay people to understand is this 42% collection rate, or 40 cents. It's like, why should it be so low? And when we say that we're collecting 75%, are we really making those numbers up? Are we lying or whatever? <clears throat> Think back 
to a bill that you might have seen. Say your brother falls and he's hit his head and he has a craniotomy and you get the bill for $10,000 and the insurance company is gonna pay $2,000. And because of this particular policy, that's all the provider is gonna get is $2,000. Can't come back to my brother for the additional $8,000. So does the board of directors of that hospital say, our collection rate's only 20%? What's wrong? No, they say we got 100% of the allowable charge. Now, we may want to rail on and on about there shouldn't, I mean, if, if you're billing something, that ought to be the amount of money that you get reimbursed for, but it doesn't happen that way. And no amount of talking, no amount of wishing that it were so is going to change that, at least for the current time. So right now, as far as I can tell, this organization, this agency that we've contracted with is doing really a pretty superb job. Now, if you compare us with the other, um, with the village of Franklin and, and the city of Fond du Lac, the demographics are different. There's not much we can do about that. Um, the people in Franklin seem to be older. The people in Sheboygan seem to be poorer. There's not much that we can do about that. So given what we have, it seems that um, this agency is doing an excellent job for us. My sense is they're probably doing a really good job on the trip thing, and if it's only $4 a claim, um, I'm just here to tell you, and, and I think staff people here could agree, $4 to submit a claim like that, that's pretty cheap. And it's why, you, it's, why we, it's why Steve McLean is not doing this job of collecting all the ambulance fees, is because it would take just a little more. <laughs> a little more <laughs> unless you want to do it, Somebody's Steve. Get a wide no. idea. <laughs> Steve is just leaving the room. <laughs> but so it, 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 they seem to be doing a good job. Um, the Finance Committee has given this long, hard uh, look. Uh, it's been discussed. I, I was on the Finance Committee when this came to us in, in 2012, and I would just urge your support uh, for passage of this contract. Attorney McLean. Uh, <clears throat> I can address, I believe, uh, Chairman's question about whether uh, you would need to modify the contract if you took the TRIP uh, intercept program collections in-house, and I think the answer is no. I'm looking at page 16 of the, uh, it's part of the Exhibit A, the Scope of Work and Responsibilities. The top paragraph says, service provider, which is EMS, or authorized external collection agency, will forward delinquent accounts to the Wisconsin Tax Refund Intercept Program trip upon request of the client. So the way I read that is if uh, we extend the contract for another two years, and we at some point decide to, we want to do the trip intercept program in-house, we would notify EMS billing service that we're going to do it in-house and uh, that portion of the pie would not be done by them but would be done by us without having to uh, amend the contract. Thank you, Attorney McLean. Uh, Is there anything? Chairman, a couple of points. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm up here, Chief. Go ahead. Um, I think the trip discussion needs to take place in finance. I think that's the division of city government that's going to be asked to do the extra work. I, I think at the point I'm at, I'm happy where it is. I think it's a good flow um, to keep that all with one agency. But again, that's council's decision, and I think that's a discussion that the finance department needs to have. <coughs> Everybody wants to maximize the most amount of revenue that we can get out of here. And we focus on what's our collection rate. It's in the 40%. We need to remember that the city's health insurance has negotiated with our network, and I believe it's a 52% discount. And we're really happy about that when we're getting that discount. And I don't remember exactly what my bill was when I had knee surgery. It was 10000 or something for the doctor. I think he got $4,600. That's a pretty big discount. It's just the medical system that we deal with. Um, and the other thing I'd like to say is I'd like to express my uh, support of renewing this contract. 
Um, the service that we've gotten from this company compared to the company that we were with before is far and above what we had seen. They're at our doorstep whenever we request additional training for our paramedics. The help they gave us with uh, transitioning to the field bridge and electronic patient care uh, reporting, they were up, I, I think it was a month they came up and, and trained our paramedics. We never saw that from our other billing company. And if I called tomorrow and asked for another training session, they'd be there. When we look back three years to when we were discussing this original contract with EMS billing, the figure of 80 to 85 percent net collections was tossed out there. We're going to get there. We're at 79 percent for 2011, and that's going to go up yet. We're going to be in that 80 to 85 percent. So I think they've delivered what they said, even with the payer mix that we're dealing with. So I think they've done a good job, and I am in support of renewal. Thanks, Chief. Uh, just to follow up on some comments that Alderperson Donahue made, any business, any business you're in, whether it's the private sector or public sector, I hope, is that after, after a number of years, uh, and you've projected a certain amount of revenue, and those revenue projections for net money in the bank and the checking account are not met, sooner or later, you have to make a business decision and we're stuck with this patient mix, I understand that. But sooner or later, you have to make a business decision with this patient mix and the amount of money that's going in the bank every year, is this a business that we continue, want, that we can continue to want to be in? And business people make that decision every day. For example, in the insurance business, Alderman Hammond, you can tell me if I'm wrong. I'm sure you, you've set goals for your commercial division, and that person that runs the co commercial division. Point of order, Mr. Chair, this conversation is about the contract and renewing it, not whether we should be in the ambulance business or not in the ambulance business. I appreciate where you're going with this, but I understand. Again, I'd ask that we focus on the contract, not on the viability of that. That's for a different discussion on a different day. Thank you. Can I continue or not? Um, you need to make a ruling, I guess, uh, on the point of order. Um, and I guess I'd be inclined to allow Alderman Bourne to go uh, continue on. You know. Thank you. Like in any other business, event, uh, the day comes when you've got, a, you've got a, a, a history of however many years it is, and your expectations were one thing when you went into the business, and that's what we were told the expectations are going to be. Can I dissent from the, um, since we, the, the chair didn't make the motion, I want to dissent from yours, and I'd like to take a vote on it. Yeah, I think the, uh, there hasn't that's been a proper motion. decision from the chair, so uh, we'll take the a vote. The chair is actually the one speaking, so right. vice chair. Uh, I think I've made I think I've made my point, so I, I won't have to go any further. But I've made my point. I'd also like to call the question. Is there a second? Second. All in favor of uh, calling the question? Aye. 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 Opposed? Chair votes aye. We'll take a vote on uh, three point one. Did you call the roll, Mary? Aye. Carlson? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Now if we can down, just go down to uh, 3.2 briefly. Uh, I just before, uh, first I would entertain a motion if somebody wants to make it to refer that to the Finance Committee for further study. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, send this to the Finance Committee under discussion. Uh, I did have, I think there was something <clears throat> that was on the uh, attachments that I received from the, uh, from the uh, City of Fond du Lac, uh, their uh, accountant in their office on, on this TRIPS thing. And I believe, uh, as Mr. Kiefer indicated earlier, I believe Fond du Lac also uses EMS billing. And it's just a paragraph. I'll just read it quickly. 
Uh, once ambulance accounts go into collections and all collections efforts have been exhausted, we put them on the State of Wisconsin Tax Refund Intercept Program trip. We have an employee that works with the city's other accounts receivable collection accounts, so we have her work the ambulance collections accounts also. She will put them on trip instead of having it done by, EM, e, the, by EMS billing. We find that putting these accounts on the state trip system, we are able to increase our collections because trip is the last option for these accounts that would have otherwise been written off. So far in 2013, we have collected approximately $50,000 that we would have not collected if these accounts were not on trip. Probably this may be the first year that they are on trip. Were you handling trip for them before, Mr. Kiefer, or is this, this is the first year they're on it? Uh, they've always handled it in journal. Okay. So I do not, I believe they started it, you know, I can't be confident of when they started it, but they've always handled it in journal. We've never handled it. Okay. Uh, they didn't make any reference in this document to how much of a commission they would have paid. They're just saying that up, uh, up, up to this point, uh, they have made $50,000 that they would have not collected had they not been on trip. So I'll let the Finance Committee hash that out, uh, but I just wanted to pass on the discussion I had with the woman from Fond du Lac that apparently for them, it's working out pretty well. And as I mentioned previously, uh, our municipal court is on the trip program and they may be a good resource for how labor intensive it is for them to do it. I would presume they probably have the same ground rules for uh, doing a municipal court trips program. But anyway, that's a resource that we have right here in the city already that they're doing it. So anyway, I look forward to that discussion in finance. We have a motion and a second to refer 3.2 to finance. Is there any further discussion? If not, would you please call the roll? Aye. 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 We have a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.